Hi, welcome back to our class again. Today, we are going to continue with chapter 6. In the previous class, we discussed about the arrive first theory, the importance of control and manipulate your enemy concept, and how the enemy can bring the advantages and dangers to you. So, today, we continue with other theories and concepts. First, Sun Tzu said, attack places where the enemy must rush to rescue. Move quickly along routes where the enemy least expects. It means that you should try to attack the places your enemy can't think of or least expect it. Same like Sun Tzu's metaphor that an army can travel for a thousand miles without being distressed and exhausted because it moves along places where there is no enemy. Choose the route that your enemy least expect you. Then you can be well prepared and attack them in surprise. Sometimes, this route might cause detour to your original plan. It might take more time, but the possibility to win will increase. So, simple in words, don't use the strategy that people have already been accustomed to or predicted. In business, you can apply the blue ocean strategy. What is the blue ocean strategy? Blue ocean strategy is the approach that suggests a company is better off searching for ways to play in uncontested marketplace instead of engaging with competition in existing marketing space. It is the idea of trying to find market spaces that are free competitors by creating and capturing new demand, making the competitions irrelevant. An example of a blue ocean strategy is Netflix. Netflix created uncontested marketing space by selling TV shows over the internet, which no one else was currently doing. By doing this, they made the competitions irrelevant, creating and capturing new demand for the service not currently available on the market. By doing this, they were able to break the value cost trade-off by providing better value than cable TV, at a lower cost than cable TV. It was because you could watch any shows you wanted at any time without commercials. By entering a blue ocean, they were able to persuade low cost and differentiation leadership compared to the alternative to their product. Then, you will ask, why do you want to operate in blue ocean markets? Why don't you just operate in red ocean markets? Red oceans represent all the industry in existence today. In the red oceans, industry boundaries are defined and accepted, and the competitive rules of the games are known. Here, companies try to outperform their rivals to grab a greater share of product or service demand. As the market space gets crowded, prospects for profits and growth are reduced. Products become commodities or niche, and cutthroat competitions turns the ocean bloody. Hence, we call red oceans. While blue oceans, in contrast, they not all in the industry, not in existence today. The unknown market space, untended by competitions, in blue oceans, demand is created rather than fraught over. There is ample opportunity for growth that is both profitable and rapid. In blue oceans, competition is irrelevant because the rules of the game are waiting to be set. Blue ocean is an analogy to describe the wider, deeper potentials of market space that is not yet explored. The authors of Blue Ocean Strategy argue that why traditional competition-based strategies are necessary. They are not sufficient to sustain high performance. Company needs to go beyond competing. To seize new profit and growth opportunities, they also need to create blue oceans. Blue Ocean Strategy on the other hand, it's based on the view that market boundaries and industry structures are not given 
and can be reconstructed by the actions and belief of industry players. This is what the author called the reconstructionist view. Assuming that structure and market boundaries exist only in managers' mind, practitioners who hold this view do not let existing market structures limit their thinking. To them, extra demand is out there, largely untapped. The crux of the problem is how to create it. This, in turn, requires a shift of attention from supply to demand, from a focus on competing to a focus on value innovations, that is, the creations of innovative value to unlock new demand. This is achieved via the simultaneous pursuit of differentiation and low cost. By expanding the demand side of the economy, new wealth is created. A good example of the Blue Ocean strategy is Apple iTunes. In 2003, Apple moved into the digital music space as a provider and distributor of content and signaled the end of the previous innovations, the CD. Apple creates iTunes as an online service where people could download legal, high-quality songs for a very reasonable price. Apple observed the flood of illegal music file programs such as Napster and LimeWire had created a network of internet-savvy music levels freely, yet illegally shredding music. By 2003, more than 2 billion illegal music files were traded every month, and the recording industry fought to stop the cannibalization of physical CDs. With the technology available to digitally download music free instead of paying for a CD, the trend towards digital music was clear. This trend was underscored by the fast-growing demands for MP3 players that play mobile digital music, such as Apple's iPod. Apple decisively capitalized on these trends with a clear trajectory by launching the iTunes online music store. Until that point, no one had been able to establish such a user-friendly system for online music, content curation and distribution. Apple's strategy was also unique in that the success of iTunes fed into Apple's other hot products, the iPods. People would go to iTunes and download music onto their iPods. Apple provided the contents, the means of acquisitions and distributions and the device a Greek blue ocean. Another reason for Apple's success is that it is more a design-driven company rather than a technology-driven company, putting customers at the center of its product innovation. In doing so, Apple created the needs for its product and then exploited its newly created market share quickly, making it very difficult for competitors to grab a piece of the pie. iTunes also leaps past free downloading services, providing sound quality as well as intuitive navigating, searching, and browsing functions. Apple's iTunes unlock a blue ocean in digital music. iTunes sprang to live as an ecosystem, a collection of carefully orchestrated hardware, software services, and content channels with unbeatable pricing. Apple then applied blue ocean thinking to the iPad. They asked, can we create a third category that is neither PC nor smartphones? Instead of offering high value laptops or lower value netbooks, can we make a new product that provides breakthrough in value for PC users? Today, the iPad defines the market. It is not so much a competitor in an established market and excels its own clear and pristine blue oceans. The iPad products show that Apple is trying to displace the way we use our computing devices and extend the usage of tablets to a larger, wider audience. They have sold over 250 million units to the beginning of 2015. Another example is we, 
a home video game console, which was released by Nintendo. Rather than releasing a more technologically advanced video game console with more features as in previous generations, Nintendo released a console with innovative controls meant to attract populations that are typically excluded from the target demographic for video games, such as the elderly groups. As of the 2012, the Wii leads its generations over PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 in worldwide sales, with more than 101 million units sold. Next example, Southwest Airlines, a major US airline which was established in 1967 and the largest lost cause career in the world. The airline has nearly 46,000 employees in 2014 and operates more than 3,400 flights per day. It offers flexibility of bus travel at the speed of air travel using the secondary airport. They show a good example as they didn't fight with their competitors in the red oceans. Instead, they created a marvelous achievement in their career industry. Okay, now we move to another theory. Sun Tzu said, if I can concentrate and unite my entire troops at one place while those of the enemy are scattered at 10 different places, then I can use my entire force again one sense of his. Like the picture, if I can use a larger and stronger force to attack a smaller and inferior one, those enemy who engage in battles against me will surely be defeated easily. Therefore, focus is one of the main essences in this theory. As Sun Tzu principle, don't scatter your team or focus in very parts. It might reduce your strength and give the opportunities for your enemy to counter-attack you. Same like in business, you must truly focus on your core business instead of losing your focus to the subsidiary businesses. If you really can control and manage the core business well, then just move to the other. Please remember to not neglect your core business. For example, Walmart. The vision of Sam Welton, founder of Walmart, built a company that offers convenience and low prices. His original intent has driven the company to huge financial gains, and the company has not changed their business model. Through the last 20 years, the company has built massive superstores, offering everything from automotive supplies to groceries and clothing. Recently, the company has expanded its one-stop shopping center empire to include small neighborhood market store. But from beginning to end, Walmart has a clear strategy, pricing. Everything that Walmart does specifically selected to keep prices low. Their famous rollback pricing strategy is designed to constantly monitor competitor pricing and offer a lower price. Through processing, shipping, warehousing, and retail marketing, Walmart is standing out by consistently giving customers exactly what they want or need at a lower cost. The market for low-cost retail store is always in constant upheaval. There are several competitors in the market, although few can come close to the scope of Walmart's organizations. The distribution channels that Walmart has put into place are one of the key factors in their success. With a network of warehouses, shipping services, and innovative stocking methods, Walmart remains a market giant for convenience and price. Developing their own integrated system for ordering, shipping, and delivering, Walmart is able to maintain their low prices. While their market saturations can be seen in the number of Walmart locations, their continual expansions can also be an indicator of its failure. Walmart is often not received well in smaller communities where residents are concerned about local businesses being affected, environmental impact and traffic concerns in the areas that Walmart is built. In addition, 
because Walmart bases their differentiations on pricing, other companies are continually trying to compete with their low prices, causing the company to find new ways to lower prices. There is constant pressure on the corporations to buy massive quantities to keep their store stock and prices low. In spite of these difficulties, however, Walmart remains a powerful market force in every geographical area that they do business in. The additions of the market stores has added additional opportunity for the corporations to attract new customers and the buying process for food items has created new lower price point products. Next, we move to another giant company which focus on quality. It is a sport gear provider, Nike. Nike is considered the premier athletic supplier for serious athletes. Their products include sports footwear, workout and performance clothes, as well as sports accessories, such as gym bags, headbands, bowls, and more. Their business model is simple, offer high quality sports materials. Nike's strategy is to establish the company as the standard in sportswear. By focusing on their product line, they are able to produce high quality products that meet customer expectations. Nike's product line is not wide. They offer sports shoes, workout clothes, and a very limited number of additional products. Their focus is clear. Give the athlete the equipment they need to succeed. This single-minded focus has allowed them to develop efficient networks of suppliers and manufacturers who can provide high-quality materials. The most provenient driver for Nike's success is their distinctive marketing strategy. Nike has established itself not only as a leading brand for athletes, but also as a leading fashion brand. Through identifications with athletes, customers are compelled to purchase their sportswear for competitive and recreational use. Another driver of success is their commitment to research and development. Within the sports market, there is a high level of competitions. To remain a leader in the industry, Nike must constantly be innovating with a new and improved tools to help the athlete perform at their peak. By maintaining level of innovations, Nike will constantly in the front of the competitions. That's all for the focus strategy. Okay, now we move to another interesting strategy, which is the change strategy. As soon as said, victories can be created by us. So, in the conduct of war, there is no fixed situation and conditions, just like water, has no constant shape and configurations. Water can change its shapes in accordance to the changing conditions. It can be solid when it becomes ice. It can also be a liquid shape and gas. So, Sun Tzu believed that the person who gains victory by adapting to the changing condition and situation of the enemy can be considered a legion in warfare. So, Sun Tzu highlighted that in this world, everything will change. Nothing will be sustaining for forever. He said that there is no guaranteed victory among the five elements of nature. There is no permanency for each of the four seasons. There are days which are short and days which are long. There are changes in the shape of moon throughout a month. Every phenomenon cannot sustain for long life. It will be changed. In the business, if you can change according to the changing condition and follow the demands of the market, then you easily create successful business. Here, I share with you some of the success examples of those who use the change strategy to change their company's destiny. First, PayPal. Believe it or not, PayPal was not founded to be the online payment service that it is today. PayPal founder Max Lefchin reveals that PayPal was originally envisioned as a cryptography company and then later as a means of transmitting money via PDAs. Only after several years, 
of trial and error and overcoming user frauds that almost destroyed the company, finally, PayPal found its sweet spot as the default online payment system of millions. The transition wasn't effortless, and the company, at various points in time, deliberated the merit of the staying, the cost of changing business models. But ultimately, their flexibility proved to be a major asset. Despite being founded in 1998, PayPal was swift enough to change course in time to go public in 2002 and later was brought out by eBay for $1.5 billion. Next, Google. For much of its early life, Google had no business model to speak of. Google was an unprofitable company, fronting left and right for a stable revenue source. After making marginally profitable forays into selling search appliance to businesses and its own search technology to other search engines, Google radically changed costs. In 2003, the company launched its AdWords programs, which allowed businesses to advertise to people searching for things on Google.com. Almost overnight, Google took the leap from popular search tool to advertising juggernaut. In 2008, Google reported to the SEC that it had generated $21 billion in advertising-driven revenue alone. To this day, AdWords comprises the lion's shares of Google's total revenues and profits. AdWords also paved the way for other search engines, such as Yahoo Search Marketing Service and MSN Bing's platform, amongst others. Third, Facebook. In its early years, Facebook consisted entirely of college students, unlike contemporaries Friendster and MySpace, which exerted themselves to acquire as many users as possible from all ends of the earth. Facebook operated more like a secret society, going so far as to require .edu email addresses in order to join. And many of their users like it that way, preferring Facebook's exclusivity to the the more the merrier approach of other social networks. The problem was that Facebook could only expand so much by catering to only college students. So, despite much protest and uproar, Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg decided to open Facebook to high school students in 2005. By 2006, the service had opened to anyone 13 years old or older with a valid email address. By and large, the strategy change has worked. Until 2015, Facebook had achieved over 1.1 billion monthly active users around the world. Facebook held its initial public offering in 2012 and began selling stock to the public. It was reaching an original peak market capitalization of $104 billion. On 2015, Facebook became the faster company which in the Standard & Poor's 500 index to reach a market cap of $250 billion. The lesson is that changes in business strategies were not incidental footnotes in the history of these businesses. Rather, in each case, the changes that will make unlocks new dimensions of revenue and profitability. However, heights of achieving that would never have been reached by staying the course. Making such changes requires both the foresight to know that existing strategies are ill-suited for future opportunities and the discipline to enact fundamental shift in corporate focus. Therefore, if you want to create another success example, please change. Change might not guarantee you success, but if you do not dare to change, it means that you will remain as what you get now. That's all for today's class. I hope that during these few classes, you enjoy it and got a bit of idea on the application of Sun Tzu out of war in business. Thanks and bye.